Four to one, copper and tin, copper and tin for a shiny skin. Shiny skin, shimmering new, copper and tin, the ring ain't true. Golden laws crack my shell, don't waste your hair on a broken bell. Broken bell, a broken bell, don't waste your hammer on a broken bell. Thank you. 
whispers The hills when the wind blows You stand dreaming Deep in the willows Two boys tumbling Chasing your shadow My name is Melanie Beard, and I'm in charge of public events at OMSI, and I will be your host tonight. I'm very excited to learn more about early earthquake warning systems, but before we get started, I have a couple things to tell you about happening at OMSI. OMSI is committed to sparking curiosity and igniting imaginations. 
to help everyone out at home, we've crafted and curated all sorts of engaging science activities and experiments to inspire you to experience the wonder of science from wherever you are. Visit omsi.edu for more information and resources. And if you do any of the science activities, please send us your photos and videos so we can see how great a scientist you are. I also hope you enjoy tonight's pre-pub trivia and music by local Portland artist, Tony Furtado. So thanks to him for sharing his uh, beautiful music. Putting on these live shows takes a lot of work and we have an amazing partner that helps us make this happen. A big thanks and shout out to Celestream for providing the live streaming services for tonight's Science Pub. We really appreciate their support. We are in the final week of our Body Worlds ex exhibition. It's at ONSI through this weekend, through Sunday, October 4th. We are also open, our USS Blueback is also open for tours. Advanced tickets are required for both. The health and safety of OMSI guests and staff is our utmost priority, and we want you to feel comfortable and safe while you're at OMSI. To meet state guidelines and to help limit the spread of COVID-19, we have implemented some changes throughout the museum. Please visit OMSI.edu for more information. I'm also very excited to tell you about our third virtual OMSI After Dark Cider Fest. I've created a box of 10 delicious Oregon ciders. Tickets are $47 and include 10 cans of cider, two tasting boxes, and access to the virtual event. You can pick up your box from OMSI or have it mailed to you if you live in Oregon for $15. Visit OMSI.edu slash cider fest for more details. And if you haven't um, been with us recently, uh, we are very excited uh, to make sure that you put the pub back in Science Pub. It supports your local community and it's a fun way to make it feel like Science Pub used to be having some fun food and drink along with your science learning. Okay, so tonight's schedule, um, if you have been to a science pub, it's pretty much like our regular events. If you haven't, um, we're going to begin with an earthquake theme trivia game that is a warm up for tonight's talk. So grab a pen and paper if you wanna participate. And after that, we'll have about a 35 minute lecture by Dr. Sarah Menson. Uh, for Q and A, you can submit your questions at any point during the lecture via the comments and our live feed on Facebook or YouTube. We'll collect them after the lecture and I will ask them of, your, of our speaker. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's lecture, please consider making a donation or purchasing a Science Pub pint glass. Don't worry, there's no pressure to donate. Our mission at OMSI is to inspire curiosity by creating engaging science learning experiences for people of all ages and backgrounds. So sit back, relax, and get ready for a great lecture right after our trivia game. This week, we have one of our awesome educators, Jennifer Powers, joining us to play along. Um, she's in charge of education in our featured exhibit. Please give her a warm welcome. Hey, Mel. Hi. Hey. Hello, how are you? I'm doing really good. I'm excited to uh, see this lecture and uh, hopefully do an okay job with this warm up and earthquake trivia. <laughs> You'll probably know some of these, or you know, you've seen enough earthquake lectures, you might know a few. So, um, we're getting ready to get started. So, if anybody wants to play along, grab a pen and paper, play against your family, maybe make it a little fun, or, you know, maybe you get bragging rights or someone else takes out the trash, you know. So, we have 10 multiple choice questions. I'll read out each question, give you time to guess, and then we'll reveal the answer before moving on to the next one. All right, me? Right. I am, I'm ready. Give it to me. All right. What does earthquake magnitude measure? Is it A, the strength? Oh, goodness. This is what happens. Okay. I was like, question. Oh, I didn't even guess. C, you're right. <laughs> Sorry. All right. First one. Okay. The first one is C, the physical size of the earthquake. Sorry, I'm trying to move this so I can read the questions. Okay, okay. number two. I think I would have gotten that wrong. So I'm glad that you, I think, I think it's good. You skipped ahead. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to do that again. Okay, number two. How long does an earthquake last? Is it A, one second, B, 10 seconds, C, one minute, or D, it depends what its magnitude is. Having been in, in several earthquakes, I would think that they last different amounts. So I'm going to go with D. 
I think that's a pretty solid guess. And guess what? You're right. <laughs> okay. Number three. What determines how much shaking you will feel? So is it A, the magnitude of the earthquake, B, how far away you are from the earthquake, C, whether you are on something hard like rock or soft like mud, or D, all of the above? I, huh, I never considered that it would matter what you were on, you know, something like if you were on concrete versus if you were in a field. But I would think that A and B are correct. So I'm going to have to go with D. All of the above? Yeah. Uh, that's, I also didn't really consider the ground, but you're right. All of the above makes sense. Yeah, that's really okay. interesting. Okay, you're doing good so far. Because you gave me that first one, Mel. That's the only reason. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> this is an interesting one. Okay, so number four. <laughs> How far shaking reaches depends in part on what kind of geologic material the ground is made of. Compared to similar earthquakes in the Western US, earthquakes in the central and Eastern US, A, shake a larger area, B, shake a smaller area, or C, shake about the same area. Oh, on what kind of geologic material the ground is made of. So I'm gonna assume then, that the Western U.S. and maybe the Central and Eastern U.S. have different types of geologic histories, uh, especially because, you know, the West Coast has a lot of mountains and, you know, that's part of our geologic history is all those volcanoes and everything yeah. comes with volcanoes. So it must be that they're either larger or smaller, but I don't know which one it is. So I'm going to go with A. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I picked the right one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really curious to hear more about this. Yeah, yeah. I'm interested to learn more about that too. <laughs> um, okay, so what should you do if you feel shaking? Should you A, drop, cover, and hold on? B, stand in a door jam, or C, go outside? All right, I have lived in the Pacific Northwest all my life. I really hope that every teacher and institution has been correct when they have told me to drop cover and hold on. <laughs> if they haven't been right, then I, I think I have some bones to pick with some people. <laughs> <laughs> you are correct. Right. <laughs> that is, you're right. That's what they've all been drilling into us. So no. Right. Yeah. I hope that I'm glad that that's true because that's exactly what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, here's wow. another good one. So number six, a subduction zone is where one tectonic plate slides under another. So off the coast of Oregon and Washington, it's the Cascadia, Cascadia subduction zone uh, where the oceanic crest of the Juan de Fuca plate slides under the North Continental, North Continental, North America. What can subduction zones cause? So is it A, earthquakes? B, tsunamis, C, volcanoes, or D, all of the above? I'm going with all of the above still. Uh, That's so weird. Because of the movements, I would think that subduction zones could be where you could get, you know, volcanoes and mountains and earthquakes and all the shaking can certainly cause tsunamis. So all of them. Yep. All of the above is usually a good guess. Yeah, and that's true. That's true. When in doubt, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you're like, you know, 100% here. So This is where it starts going downhill, Mel. You've jinxed it. <laughs> uh, okay, where do the world's largest earthquakes occur? So is it A, where one tectonic plate slides under another, like where we live? B, where one tectonic plate slides under another, um, or C, where two tectonic plates separate from each other. So these are really the, all the three different zones in the United States. Hmm. Uh, whoa, no. Okay, I, I don't know. C, e, this is where it all goes downhill from here. I would think that the San Andreas Fault in California, where the tectonic plates are sliding past each other. I'm guessing B. Okay. Let's see. Nope. No. It's A. <laughs> where they slide underneath each other. All right. Which is also where we live. Which so. is also where we live. That's why we've been preparing for this very large earthquake and why having an early warning system would be extremely cool. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Okay, number eight. Since 1900, every magnitude eight plus earthquake in the U.S. has occurred where? Is it A, Alaska, B, Cascadia, or C, California? Hmm. I guess California. But maybe I shouldn't because I guessed California for the last one and I got it wrong. That's true. I mean, you might, they're, well, I would say they seem sort of rare, but I could be wrong about this. The magnitude eight is pretty high. So magnitude eight is really high. I'm sticking with, I'm sticking with my California answer. Okay. It is a Alaska. Alaska. What? That wasn't even on my list of possibilities. <laughs> All right. Alaska. Good to know. I guess I really do need to listen to this lecture. <laughs> uh, okay. Here's another one. So number nine, the largest earthquake ever recorded in Oregon or rather off the shore of Oregon was the uh, magnitude 8.7, 9.2 Cascadia earthquake that occurred at 9 PM on January 26, 1700. How do we know the time of the earthquake so precisely? Is it A, time traveling seismologists? I hope so, yep. <laughs> listed in all the local newspapers. C, it woke up people in New York. Or D, we can work backwards from when the tsunami arrived in Japan. Hmm. Wow. I'm going to go with the, um, we can think about when the tsunami arrived in Japan and assume that we can extrapolate from there. Exactly. I was like, it sounds like the most scientific answer, right? It does sound like the most scientific answer. Although I would love if it woke people up in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> well, Good that's Good crazy that we can do that, especially in 1700. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, finally, number 10. So okay. what earthquake did wake up people in New York? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> was it A, the 1964 magnitude 9.2 Great Alaskan Earthquake? B, 1906 magnitude 7.9 San Francisco Earthquake? Or C, the 1811 magnitude 7.5 Northeast Arkansas, New Madrid, Missouri Earthquake? I just, the other two seem too far away. So I'm going with the, the Northeast Arkansas, Missouri Earthquake. Although the one in Alaska is very large. That's a good guess. You're right. Closest yeah. was made the most sense. Otherwise, I mean, the Great Alaskan Earthquake would have to go all the way through Canada, get all the way down to New York. So, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's possible. Sarah needs to tell us whether or not that's, yeah. that's legit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, all right. Thank you for letting me play. I did yeah. okay. <laughs> For joining you did a great job Woo round of applause Woo thank you, thank you. well all right um i'm really excited to learn more about some early warning systems especially for this earthquake we have coming up so <laughs> awesome thanks yeah. for joining us all right have fun i'll see you bye Okay, now uh, I would like to introduce our speaker, but right before that, I would like to tell you how OMSI is involved with the Shake Alert project. So while scientists like Sarah Minson are working on the research and technical aspects essential to the Shake Alert system, a number of other partners, including OMSI, are focused on education and outreach. Working with the Shake Alert Joint Community Committee for Education and Outreach, OMSI is helping create activities and animations that can be used in the museum or the classroom. Ever wonder why the West Coast is earthquake prone? How different built kinds of buildings behave during earthquakes? Or what Native American oral history can tell us about seismology? Check out the growing collection of educational resources at www.iris.edu slash shake alert. Uh, okay, now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Sarah Minson is a research ge geophysicist with the U.S. Geological Survey's Earthquake Science Center. Her research interests include using probabilistic inference for seismological problems, such as determining the physics of earthquake ruptures and eliminating the slip disruption and predicting the ground motion from earthquakes in real time for earthquake early warning. Sarah received her bachelor's from the University of California, Berkeley, 
her master's and doctorate from the California Institute of Technology. She is a recipient of the President Presidential Early Career Awards for Scientists and Engineers and a Cavalry Fellow. When not working on science, Sarah follows instructions from her cat. All right, take it away, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out virtually tonight to be part of this fun experience, or at least the part so far was fun. I hope the rest of it turns out to be fun, too. So tonight, I'm going to be talking about earthquake early warning. But what I'd like to do is start about talking about two earthquake anniversaries. The first one is from 320 years ago, when a magnitude 9 earthquake occurred off the coast of Oregon and Washington on January 26, 1700, at 9 p.m. because while we don't have exact records here from then, we do know when the tsunami it spawned reached Japan and walking backwards from that, we can tell you exactly when this earthquake happened. And in fact, you can see this earthquake today. If you go out to the coast, there are places along the coast where you will see these drowned forests, they're called ghost forests, where you see the remains of a forest that has since died coming out of the ocean. And of course it has died because trees can't grow in the ocean. And you might be wondering, how did it get there? Trees can't grow in the ocean. And the way that happened is when they were growing, it was not ocean. The Juan de Fuca plate, the crust under the Pacific Ocean, or at least under the Pacific Ocean near us, is coming underneath the continent of North America. And it's, it's a little stuck. And as it sticks, it bends the North America plate upwards. And on this beautiful continent, trees grow very majestically, but then an earthquake happens and it releases all that stored energy and the bulge goes away. And trees that had formerly been above sea level are now underwater, which they cannot survive, which is how you end up with a ghost forest sticking out of the ocean. So you can go to the coast and you can see the earthquake from 1700. In more recent years, 31 years ago this October, was a magnitude 6.9 earthquake um, that happened in the San Francisco Bay Area during the World Series, the Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, it's notable not just for happening during a World Series, but also it was the first time that earthquake warnings were issued in the United States. You might remember that sadly, the single greatest loss of, loss of life occurred on the Cypress Street viaduct when it collapsed during the shaking from this earthquake. And that viaduct was located in Oakland. The earthquake happened in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And so what the USGS, the US Geological Survey did is in the days after Loma Prieta, there were lots of workers climbing around on this incredibly damaged viaduct. And so the USGS put seismometers out in the Santa Cruz Mountains to detect every aftershock. And every time there was an aftershock, they would send a radio signal to a receiver located um, in Oakland to, uh, so that people could be alerted that they were shaking coming their way. And they picked up 12 magnitude 3.7 and greater aftershocks. And there was about 20 seconds of lead time before between when the earthquake happens in the Santa Cruz Mountains and when the shaking makes it all the way up the bay to Oakland. So, Earthquake early warning. There is an earthquake early warning system that's being built for the West Coast United States. It's currently live in California and it will be coming soon to Oregon and Washington. And um, as uh, Melody was just telling you, OMSI and ShakeAlot and IRIS are doing great work to make educational materials to explain what ShakeAlot is and how it works. Let me attempt to do a bad job. Okay, <laughs> earthquake early warning. So the idea is that you can't forecast earthquakes, but much like the midnight ride of Paul Revere, you do not forecast that when the British are coming, you just, once the British have arrived, you get out in front of the situation and you give people warning before something bad arrives at their location. So similarly, the idea is that you have seismometers located absolutely everywhere in case an earthquake happens anywhere, and then wherever it happens, you pick up the first seismic waves from it. That's usually what's called the P wave or the primary wave, which travels at around four miles per second. And then you send an alert to everyone and you get an alert and 
if you're some distant people in a city or some distant important piece of infrastructure, you get warning before the shaking from the earthquake arrives at your location, just like Paul Reveal getting out in front and telling people what's coming along behind him. Um, the alert travels out, information travels at the speed of light, and it turns out that the strongest shaking from an earthquake is carried not by the primary P wave, by what's called the S wave, the secondary wave, because it arrives later and it travels slower. It still travels at two miles per second, but it's a little bit slower and it gives you even more warning time. And so the idea is that there was some zone right on top of the earthquake. Well, unfortunately, you can't get an alert because, again, this isn't um, predicting earthquakes, right? You're detecting that an earthquake has happened. You're figuring out what's going on. And then you send the alert to everyone. And the farther away you are, the longer it takes for the shaking to get to your location. And so the more warning time you get. So let's step through what that might look like for a big earthquake. So let's look at the San Andreas Fault in California. And let's consider a scenario earthquake that starts at the very southern end of the San Andreas Fault near the Salton Sea, near the California-Mexico border, and then travels north up the San Andreas Fault to Los Angeles. Um, it takes about 90 seconds for an earthquake that big to get all the way from the southern end of California to Los Angeles. So what happens is, okay, the earthquake starts and at first you can't issue an alert because you're just detecting that this earthquake has started, but then you send an alert to everyone and the amount of warning time you get depends on how far away you are. So it takes about 25 seconds for the shaking to arrive at, to arrive at Palm Springs. So that's 25 seconds of warning to Palm Springs. It takes about 50 seconds for the shaking to arrive in San Bernardino. So 50 seconds of warning to San Bernardino, a minute 10 warning to Anaheim and Orange County, and then about a minute and a half warning to Los Angeles. Um, similarly, if there was an earthquake on the Northern San Andreas Fault that started as far away from, Calif from San Francisco as possible and then traveled towards San Francisco, you'd again get about 90 seconds of warning before the shaking arrived at San Francisco or perhaps more relevant to us tonight. If there was another great big magnitude nine earthquake on the Cascadia subduction zone off the coast of Oregon, Washington, and Northern California, and it conveniently chose to start as far away from us as possible at Cape Mendocino in Northern California, and then travel north to Seattle, it would take five minutes to reach Seattle. And so you could get up to five minutes of warning in Seattle. Um, so you see this description of earthquake early warning absolutely everywhere. Here are some things I, I, I borrowed from Shake Alert. Um, you see this in uh, newspaper articles. Here's a picture from the New York Times, another one from the Washington Post, where you see there's an earthquake and there's no warning time in the center, but then you have these concentric circles of increasing warning time as you get farther away from the earthquake. Uh, you see the same thing in educational materials. I borrowed these pictures from Japan and China's earthquake early warning systems. Um, you also see this in the scientific literature in journal articles. But here's the thing about what I've told you so far. Everything I've told you so far is wrong. Oops. Scientific discovery is a process. And what we know tomorrow may be amazing and different from what we know today. Because science is a living, breathing, evolving thing. And there's always lots of work that still needs to be done. So. Now, let me tell you why earthquake early warning doesn't work this way. And let's talk about how earthquake early warning really works. Okay, so the first thing we need to think about is the fact that earthquake early warning is a terrible name. Again, we're not predicting a future earthquake. We're not warning you for the earthquake. The earthquake already happened or at most is still happening. What this is is shaking early warning we are warning you before the shaking from the earthquake arrives at your location. Shaking is different than an earthquake, right? An earthquake is one thing to everyone. For example, on March 25th, 1993, there was a magnitude 5.6 earthquake northeast of Salem, period, end of story. But shaking is different for different people. So this is a picture, this is what we call a shake map of the shaking on a map from this earthquake that occurred um, in 1993, northeast of Salem. And so what you see is the shaking is very strong northeast of Shalem, Salem, and it decreases with distance until by the time you get up to Portland, it's pretty weak. So let me ask you a question, who do you warn? 
Do you war on Salem? Do you war on Portland? Do you war on Seattle? Well, I think that kind of depends on who you are, because the shaking that matters for one person may not matter for another. And as I go through these examples, I, I want to stress that this is completely fictional, right? Um, these are just thought experiments I made up. Okay. So let's say that you are a lady with a vase, right? You inherited this vase from your grandmother. You love it very, very much. And you do not want it to get knocked over by an earthquake and break. So you are interested in even the weak shaking that might potentially knock over your vase. On the other hand, if you are operating a train system, you probably don't care about shaking that might knock over a vase. You probably only care about the really strong shaking that might potentially um, damage your tracks and put your trains at risk. And again, fictional examples, I do not have an heirloom vase. I am not a train engineer. <laughs> but another thing that's important about these two examples is these are people who would probably prefer to play it better safe than sorry, right? I mean, if you love this vase and you don't want to lose it, you probably want to get warned if there's even a small chance that it might get knocked over and you will grab that face. And if it turns out the shaking was so weak that it wasn't even a threat to your vase, you just let go and go about your day. Same thing with the train, right? If you may not want to be warned except for very strong shaking, but if it turns out the shaking isn't that strong and you've stopped your trains for nothing, well, then you just start your trains again, resume service, no problem. But that's not true for everything, right? Some actions have consequences such that you can't afford a false alarm. And by false alarm, I mean taking action when the shaking isn't actually a threat to you, whether or not there was an earthquake, right? Because if it was a tiny earthquake that didn't produce substantial shaking and you took action for no reason, that might not matter to the lady with the vase or to the train, but it could matter to you if there are serious repercussions to taking action. What if we're talking about an emergency shutdown of a nuclear power plant? What if we're talking about cutting the gas lines to a major metropolitan area? These are actions that have consequences. And this is something that we've been seeing a lot in California, where our utility company has um, begun doing what they call public safety power shutoffs, where they will um, turn off the power in a, uh, for precautionary safety if they suspect that wildfire risk is exceptionally high. And it's really, really, really important to protect against wildfires. But at the same time, people need electricity and there are consequences to turning off electricity. So um, for example, UC Berkeley claimed that they lost $500,000 in cancer research during a power shutoff. People can be oxygen dependent. So some users may be forced alarm tolerant, but other potential safety actions may have significant consequences. And again, shaking depends on how big the earthquake is and how close you are. So it's not going to be the same for everyone. So in this example of this earthquake that happened northeast of Salem, um, right, if you are really close to the earthquake, the shaking's pretty strong. So the lady with the vase is definitely going to be is definitely going to want to be warned, but also possibly our, our fictional nuclear power plant would want to take action because that's a lot of shaking. However, up here in Portland, well, the lady with the vase could potentially still be impacted. So she would still want to be warned, but a fictional nuclear power plant in Portland, that shaking just isn't strong enough to be a significant hazard to them. And if you were all the way out on the coast, well, then the shaking would be so light that not even the lady with the vase would probably want to be warned. On the other hand, if you had a same earthquake in the same place, but its magnitude was smaller, like this 2017 earthquake, similar location, but just a magnitude four. Well, in that case, even if you were right near where the earthquake happened, northeast of Salem, the shaking would be so weak that only the lady with the vase would want to be warned, but certainly not our imaginary nuclear power plant. So the question of whether or not you warn our imaginary nuclear power plant northeast of Salem is really a question of how big is the magnitude of this earthquake? Is it big enough that it's gonna produce really strong shaking or is it so small that it's only gonna produce light shaking? Well, in order to answer that question, I think we next have to answer what is earthquake magnitude? An earthquake magnitude is literally the size of the earthquake. It is the length of the fault that moved times the width 
of the fault that moved times how far one side of the fault moved relative to the other. So um, in this little picture at the right, I show the um, length of the San Andreas Fault that ruptured in the 1906 Great San Francisco earthquake and in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. So the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake ruptured 25 miles of the San Andreas Fault with about six feet of slip across the fault. That's about 30 billion cubic feet of earthquake. But the 1906 San, San Francisco earthquake, well, that ruptured 300 miles of the San Andreas all the way down uh, from San Juan Bautista in the south, all the, way north, all the way north to Cape Mendocino. And the average slip across the fort was about two to 32 feet, depending on where you were. So that is a trillion cubic feet of earthquake. Now, these are really big numbers, 30 billion, a trillion. We don't usually like to talk about numbers that are so big. So just to make it handy, to make the numbers small enough that you can fit them in your pocket or write them down easily, we have a nice handy dandy log scale. And we say, by definition, 30 billion cubic feet is a magnitude 6.9. And a trillion cubic feet is magnitude 7.9. So when we t talk about the magnitude of an earthquake, we are literally talking about how far the earthquake ran. But here's the thing, that also means that larger earthquakes take longer to happen because the thing that makes them a larger magnitude earthquake is the fact that they ran farther. And since earthquakes run down faults at about the same speed, the farther you go down the fault and thus the larger the magnitude you are, the longer it takes. So I'm going to show side by side, top and bottom, the 1906 magnitude 7.8 earthquake and the 1989 magnitude 6.9 Loma Prieta earthquake. And just look at how long it takes for these things to happen. So the red line is the fault that ruptured. And um, you can see they're both going. And after about 15 seconds, the entire length of the San Andreas fault that goes in the Loma Prieta earthquake has gone. The shaking from that rupture is spreading out across the Bay Area, but the earthquake itself is done. It, is, it has grown up to be magnitude 6.9 and it has stopped. But that's not true for the San Francisco earthquake. It's not a magnitude 6.9. It keeps going and going until it goes all the way down to San Juan Batista in the south and Cape Mendocino in the north. 150 miles to the south and 150 miles to the north. And the fact that it goes that far before it finally stops is the thing that makes it a magnitude 7.8 and not a magnitude 6.9. And how long does it take? to run that entire distance of fault and grow up from nothing all the way up to magnitude 7.8, it takes so long that I'm gonna get bored and advance the slide. Okay, so this is the key problem. Earthquakes are not psychic and neither is earthquake early warning. There's very good reason to think that earthquakes don't know how large they are going to be in advance, right? A magnitude six earthquake is just a magnitude five earthquake that didn't stop and went on to be a magnitude six. And a magnitude seven earthquake is a magnitude five earthquake that went on to be a magnitude six earthquake and didn't stop and went on to become a magnitude seven. And a magnitude eight earthquake is a magnitude five that just kept going and going and going until eventually it became a magnitude eight earthquake and then finally stopped. So, if I'm the lady with the vase who only cares about the weak shaking that you might get from a magnitude five earthquake, because even a little magnitude five earthquake produces enough shaking that it might knock something off a shelf, then I care about magnitude five earthquakes. And I only have to wait a second to see this earthquake grow up from nothing to be magnitude five and go, hey, this earthquake is big enough that it might be a threat to you. Go grab your vase now. So let's see what that looks like for the 2014 La Habra earthquake. Just a second, that's all it takes to become a magnitude five earthquake and to say, oops, better grab your vases. But what if you are the fictional nuclear power plant who only cares about really strong shaking that could damage heavy infrastructure? Well, then you don't care about the light shaking from a magnitude five. You don't care about anything smaller than about a magnitude seven, which means I don't know that this is gonna be a dangerous earthquake until it's grown up to be a magnitude seven. And so I have to wait for it to be a magnitude five and then for about three seconds for it to be a magnitude six and then probably at least 15 seconds to see it become a magnitude seven. 
And all that time, while I'm waiting to see just how big this earthquake is going to get, while the shaking is already coming at you, and I am eating vulnerable warning time from you. So here's the issue. Big earthquakes last a long time. And you don't necessarily get more warning time for bigger earthquakes. It just takes longer to see how big they are going to end up. Because earthquakes are not psychic, and neither was earthquake early warning. But I, I want to make something really clear at this point, right? I talk about earthquakes not being psychic or that we can't predict earthquakes. And we do have a tendency to romanticize them, to think that they have something to do um, with the phase of the moon or the behavior of animals or the, uh, some sort of special crystals or something. And I wanted to make something really clear about earthquakes. Earthquakes are not magical ponies. Earthquakes obey very simple laws of physics, and we understand this physics very well. In fact, earthquakes are very much like a set of dominoes, right? One point on the fault moves, and its movement transfers force and stress to the, fort, to the parts of the fault next to it. And depending on how much force it transfers and how close the next point on the fault is to, to being pushed over, how easy it is to knock over, the next point on the fault may move. And then maybe the next. And then maybe the next. Most times they don't go very far, but every once in a while, it goes a long distance. And if we could look at the fault, if we could see exactly how all the dominoes were lined up, we could tell you how far the run was going to go. But unfortunately, we don't get to see the dominoes on the fault because we don't get to see the fault because the fault is buried under miles and miles of rock. So when I talk about us not being able to predict earthquakes, it's not because they're magical. It's because they're buried under miles and miles of rock. Okay, so if you can't predict the future, if I can't tell you how many dominoes are going to fall, all I can do is watch the dominoes as they are falling and say, have enough dominoes been knocked over that this earthquake is going to produce strong shaking that's hazardous to our fictional power plant? Or have only a few dominoes been knocked over such that it's shaking, such that it's definitely damaging to the lady with the vase, but I don't think it's actually going to hurt, hurt the fictional power plant. Okay, well, I'm watching dominoes fall over. And I get to send out an alert when I see enough dominoes fall over that I think it's going to produce shaking that is of interest to either the lady with the vase or the fictional power plant. Well, since the lady with the vase cares about weak shaking, all I have to do is see a few dominoes fall. All I have to see is about a second of dominoes falling to go, yep, this could produce weak shaking that could knock over a vase, warn the lady with the vase. So only about a second to get out a warning to all. But at this point, only a few dominoes have fallen. I don't know whether this earthquake is going to stop now or if it's going to keep going. And only if it keeps going will it be a threat to our fictional power plant. I won't know that it's going to be a threat to the fictional power plant until about 12 seconds of dominoes have fallen. But here's the thing. While I'm watching dominoes fall, the shaking from the falling dominoes are already coming at us. So since it takes longer to issue an alert for stronger shaking, since I have to wait to see even more dominoes fall to know that this is a big magnitude earthquake that is capable of producing strong shaking, there is less warning time for the people who want to be warned for strong shaking. So, and by the same argument, there is a lot more warning time if I warn you for weak shaking because I can get that load out as soon as just a few dominoes fall. So if I'm the fictional lady with the vase who I can send out an alert to for after just one second, and it takes about six seconds for the shaking to get to you, that still leaves five seconds of warning. But if it takes five, six seconds for the warning to get to you, I'm oh, sorry, if it takes six seconds for the shaking to get to you, but I have to wait 12 seconds to know that this is going to be a big earthquake that could produce the kind of strong shaking that might affect a fictional power plant, well, then I've eaten up all the warning time. 
And note that being further away doesn't necessarily give you more warning. It just means that you have to wait even longer to see that it's going to be an even larger magnitude earthquake that could produce strong shaking farther away. Okay, so let's go back and look at that fictional Southern San Andreas Fault earthquake again, the one that starts very far south near the Salton Sea, near the Mexico border, and then a minute and a half later makes it up to Los Angeles. Okay, so the earthquake starts, and again, you can't send an alert out right away because you're detecting that an earthquake is beginning. But then here's the thing. I don't, I don't think you send an alert to everyone because right at this moment, this is a teeny tiny earthquake way the far south in Southern California. And the expected shaking from this tiny earthquake that's far away in the Southern California desert is less than 1% G, less than 1% the force of gravity, less than 1% the force that you feel right now sitting in your chair listening to me babble on. The shaking in Palm Springs is maybe 2% G. That's kind of the level of shaking where you feel the shaking and you go, yeah, that's shaking. So maybe that's the level that you warn for the, the lady with the vase. So maybe you send a alert to people with vases in Palm Springs, but you wouldn't even send an alert to somebody with a vase in Los Angeles. And you wouldn't send an alert to somebody with a fictional power plant anywhere, not even in Palm Springs. So 25 seconds later, when the sh shaking has arrived in Palm Springs, the expected shaking in Los Angeles is still just 1% G. At this point, you would maybe warn people with vases in Anaheim, but you would not warn even somebody with a vase in Los Angeles, and let alone somebody with a fictional power plant. 50 seconds in, when the shaking arrives at San Bernardino, still only 4% G expected in Los Angeles. You probably wouldn't want to warn heavy infrastructure until you got up to at least let's say 20% G. 20% G is the level where you just begin to get structural damage, but really minor, so like cracks and chimneys and things like that. So a minute and a half later, when the shaking has arrived in Los Angeles, actually the expected shaking from this earthquake is still just 11% G. So let's, let's see what that earthquake that future potential earthquake along the Cascadia subduction zone looks like. So let's do that rupture that starts conveniently in Northern California and takes five minutes to get to Seattle. And in the box, I'm going to show how many seconds are left until the shaking arrives in Portland and until the shaking arrives in Seattle. And I'm also gonna show you how much shaking is expected at this point. And as this goes on, ask yourself, at what point would you like to be alerted? Would you like to be alerted when the expected shaking is low, just in case the earthquake goes on to produce strong shaking? Or are you concerned about the consequences of taking action unnecessarily, such that you don't want to be warned until we know that this is an earthquake that will produce strong shaking in, at your location? But that's going to take longer, and so there's going to be less warning time left. Okay, let's watch this. So here are the earthquake starts. And there's no shaking expected in Portland because this earthquake is way the heck down in California. But when it gets up to about 2% G, well, this is when you might want to consider warning people with phases, right? So you could get over a minute of warning to the lady with the vase. But what if you're some kind of heavy infrastructure that only cares about like 20% G or higher? How much warning time do you get for that? Not much, if any, possibly none. And so there's this trade-off. Do you want to get warned for weaker shaking and have more warning time or wait till the shaking is forecast to be strong and have less warning time? Let's, let's see that one more time just so that we can make up our minds. So about two minutes in, you know there's going to be a tiny amount of shaking in Portland. About 80, se 80 seconds in, with 80 seconds to go, you know that there is going to be shaking that you'll feel in Portland. And potentially at this point, you could say maybe some minor structural damage. But in any case, 
despite the fact that it takes five minutes for the shaking to get to Seattle, it doesn't mean that you get five minutes of warning in Seattle because when this earthquake starts, it's two states away. And there's no shaking expected in Seattle from a tiny earthquake two states away. So this is the question. Do you want to be alerted early and often for every little baby earthquake just in case it grows up to be a big earthquake that produces damaging shaking at your location? Or do you want to wait to know for sure that this earthquake is a hazard to you and then risk the warning possibly being too late? And remember, most baby earthquakes never grow up to be big earthquakes. For every magnitude eight earthquake, like the 1906 Great San Francisco earthquake, there are approximately 10 magnitude seven earthquakes, like the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, about 100 magnitude 6 earthquakes, like the earthquake that happened in Napa in 2014, about 1,000 magnitude 5 earthquakes, 10,000 magnitude 4 earthquakes, 100,000 magnitude 3 earthquakes, and so on and so forth. So who can benefit from earthquake early warning? Well, I think the person who can get the most use from it is the lady with the vase, because she genuinely cares about weak shaking that might knock over a vase. And we can give you long warning times for weak shaking. Further, she also has a high false alarm tolerance, right? If you give her an alert and the shaking turns out not to be strong enough to even threaten a vase, well, then she simply lets go of her vase and goes on about her day. There isn't much loss there. I think the next best earthquake early warning user is the fictional train. Okay, the fictional train only cares about strong shaking, and we can't really give you a lot of warning time for strong shaking. But the fictional train is also false alarm tolerant, right? If I give you a warning about a baby earthquake, just in case it goes up to be a big earthquake, you can stop your train. And then if it does turn out to be a baby earthquake that wasn't threatening, you can just resume service, and there isn't significant loss. So you could take a better safe than sorry strategy and say, please warn me for the baby earthquakes just in case they grow on to be threatening and get plenty of warning time that way. But what if you are someone who genuinely cares about only the kind of strong shaking that can damage heavy infrastructure and who can't afford to take precautionary action unnecessarily, who can't afford to do the better safe than sorry approach because there are serious repercussions to taking action, like a fictional nuclear power plant. In that case, earthquake early warning may not be for you. So here is your take home message. Earthquakes are not psychic and neither is earthquake early warning and warning time doesn't necessarily increase with distance. So the next time that you see one of these pictures that shows concentric circles of increasing warning time with distance, you say no, because earthquake early warning is not psychic and neither are earthquakes. And again, this is not because earthquakes are magical results. They are not. They obey very simple laws of physics. We understand physics. We could totally tell you what was coming if we could just measure the physical state of the fault, but we can't because it's buried under miles and miles of rock. So earthquake early warning is really gonna be about taking a calculated risk, right? If you only take action when it's certain that the earthquake will produce damaging shaking at your location, you're gonna miss warnings for most damaging earthquakes. Instead, the best strategy is to gamble on taking action on small earthquakes just in case they happen to produce strong shaking and hope in the long run the odds pay off to your advantage. But you know, this actually isn't really different than how any other kind of warning works, right? Think of earthquake warning like a sped up version of flash flood warning or hurricane warning or tornado warnings, right? How, if you're in the affected area, you should take action to protect yourself, even though only a small fraction of people in your area will be directly impacted by the flood or the hurricane or the tornado, or the earthquake. So how many times have you received a flash flood warning? How many times have you personally drowned in a flash flood? I hope the answer is zero. Similarly, in this picture at the bottom, right, everybody was warned to take protective action because tornadoes were coming, but technically only three, these three houses were impacted by the tornado. Really, they were the only ones that needed to be warned Loading everybody else was a false alarm for them. They could have been there watching the tornado go by, but 
That's not how tornado warning works, right? You warn the whole area that there is a threat, that there are tornadoes in this region, and everybody takes protective action just in case, even though only a few locations will be directly impacted. And this better safe than sorry approach is exactly what happened 31 years ago after the Loma Prieta earthquake. Because remember, I said that they sent alerts for every aftershock, which were mostly little ones, magnitude 3.7. Well, the idea was that there are people in danger, right? There are workers on a piece of infrastructure that is highly damaged, the collapsed Cypress Street viaduct. They are in a very vulnerable position. It is better to play this better safe than sorry and send them an alert when there is even an aftershock that's tiny, just in case it's something that's dangerous. And indeed, that's what they did. They sent alerts for magnitude 3.7 and larger aftershocks. A magnitude 3.7 aftershock is tiny. It's, it's not going to hurt anyone, but people were in a precarious situation. And the idea was it's better to play it safe than sorry. Okay, shake a lot. It is operating in California. It is coming soon to Oregon and Washington. It, if you get an alert that shaking is coming, you should drop, cover, and hold on to protect yourself. If you don't get an alert, anytime you feel shaking from an earthquake, you should drop, cover, and hold on to protect yourself. Please do not go outside, go to a doorway, go anywhere. There are more things that can hurt you outside than inside, right? Outside, there are falling bricks, there are power lines, there are air conditioners, there are gargoyles, right? On top of that, it turns out that a lot of earthquake injuries come simply from people trying to move around while the ground is shaking, and then they just fall flat on their face and break their nose, or they step on broken glass or something. Please, if you feel shaking, don't go anywhere, don't try to move, just drop, cover, and hold on. And I know that sounds scary, right? We've all seen pictures of damaged buildings, and you're thinking, I don't want to be in that building during an earthquake. Are you sure about that? I mean, even this, this picture in the top center, this very heavily damaged building. I mean, if you were in that building during this earthquake, your experience of the earthquake might have been something like, oh, look, a new picture window. Whereas if you were standing outside on the street during this earthquake, your experience of this earthquake is bricks falling out of the sky. And in that picture I was showing on the previous slide from the 2003 San Simeon earthquake in Paso Robles, tragically, two people were killed. They were the two people that ran outside from this building and were fatally injured when the exterior collapsed. The people who stayed inside this building were fine. And I, I know that sounds scary, stay inside a building during an earthquake, but think of it like a car accident, right? If you were in an automobile and you knew you were about to have a crash, your best bet is to make sure that your seatbelt is fastened tight and just hang on and ride it out. If you were in a car and you knew you were about to have a crash, that is not the time to climb outside and go car surfing. So if you get an alert or if you feel shaking, whether or not you get an alert, please drop, cover, and hold on. And please remember that most alerts will be precautionary, right? The idea is that you shelter when weak shaking is expected just in case the earthquake goes on to produce strong shaking, even though most baby earthquakes will not grow up to be big earthquakes that produce strong shaking. This is the better safe than sorry approach to earthquake early warning. Okay, so I would like to thank OMSI so much. I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation, IRIS, and SSA, the Seismological Society of America, who have um, sponsored this talk for me. And I would like to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Minson. That was a great lecture. Um, I love the funny bits too. So I appreciate the seriousness of it because it is very serious, but I also appreciated uh, the levity when you had it in there. So nice job. Um, <clears throat> great, so we're gonna take some questions. We definitely have a few to start. So if you haven't already submitted a question, please feel free to put it in the comments. 
So somebody had a question um, during one of the slides. So this was, um, I think an earlier slide uh, was key problem, earthquakes are not psychic. They were asking, is this why the Anchorage quake had such long shaking time? So I don't know if you remember that specific slide. <clears throat> um, so this is, this is a great question. So there are two things that contribute to how long you feel shaking. The first one is how long the earthquake takes, right? You can't, you, <laughs> the shaking is sort of at least as long as the earthquake actually lasts. So longer magnitude earthquakes take longer to happen because you are f running down a longer length of fault. So you will feel longer shaking, right? Loma Prieta was over in 15 seconds, boom. But um, um, the 1906 earthquake ran on and on and on. Now, on top of that, whatever you are on can have particular resonances, right? So if you're in a basin or something, or if you're on like uh, soft mud sediments or something like that, right? There's all sorts of things that can like trap waves or focus waves and make them bounce around and last longer on top of the length of the shaking that's coming at you from the earthquake, right? It's, it's um, almost sort of like a musical instrument, right? You can get overtones and reverberations and echoes um, because these are waves. They're just like sound waves. In fact, the P wave is literally the same kind of wave as an acoustic wave. It is, it is a, a wave that travels in the direction of motion, just like sound. Sound comes out of your mouth like this. And that's actually literally what the P wave of an earthquake is doing. So it behaves a lot like sound. And, as, and so when I'm talking to you, uh, you hear as long as I'm talking, but if my microphone and my webcam starts being terrible and starts creating an echo of feedback, you might hear me talking even longer than I am actually talking. Gotcha. <clears throat> Interesting. Okay. Um, let's see. So there is a question about sensors and what improvements to sensors would be most helpful in making earlier detection earlier? that's possible, like more or more sensitive uh, sensors? So really just quantity is the single biggest mm -hmm. impression. Like because we don't know where the next earthquake is, we don't know where the first domino is going to start falling because we don't get to see the state of the faults. So we don't get to see which is the one that's about to go. Um, you just, you just, if you want to speed up the detection time, you might, you want to have a seismometer right at the spot that's going first, which means you just want to blink it to the ground with as many seismometers as possible so that you're not waiting for the seismic waves to travel out to some to the newest seismometer that's really, really far away to then get this whole process started. So it's not really about being fancy or special or best. It's This is a quantity over quality situation. Gotcha. So did they have, because they started the system in California first, does California have more sensors than Oregon and Washington? Yes, but it, it also had a head start because it's California and they have a lot of earthquakes and they had been building a lot of network. So um, the main part of building the early warning system has been densifying the seismic networks. And there have been a lot of additional stations put out in Oregon and Washington. Um, and California, everything's gotten a lot denser, but California is still the, um, the leader. And like a country like Japan, they have an incredibly dense seismic network. Mm. So another question, um, so there's, I was gonna say, there's like someone in charge of sending out the alerts. Are they all like, there? are they all run by like the USGS, like all in the same, um, organization, or is it multiple organizations working together to make this happen? Good question. So, yes, there are definitely multiple organizations. Um, there's a, uh, it's a collaboration with several universities, um, University of Oregon, University of Washington, UC Berkeley, Caltech, um, University of Nevada Vida has also started helping with things like, and probably more people will come on board, you know, as we expand geographically and also, you know, just out of collaboration. Um, also, you know, uh, the emergency management organizations, the, the governments of the states of Oregon, Washington, California. Um, in terms of determining when to issue an alert, well, really the question is like, 
it's the question of the lady with the vase versus the the you know fictional nuclear power plant. Like, do you want for weak shaking or medium shaking or strong shaking? And that the question to some extent depends on how you um, deliver the message. And there will be multiple ways of delivering it. So there are apps that you could download to to receive messages, and then you can you know set your own setting and say I want you know weak or shaking or strong or shaking, and you can sort of dial that yourself. But for things like triggering the emergency alert system, you know, the thing that goes beep, 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 like you, you can't tell all that, right? That's broadcast. So um, sort of there's a process by which that gets decided, you know, in collaboration with the, the state government and trying to, to pick a level for everyone, but you don't get to customize what your television or your radio or your phone says to you. Gotcha. Um, okay, so we have another question. I had heard that the kinetic energy released from a quake, say the buildup in pressure is particularly strong, has an effect on shaking intensity. Is that true or is that mostly seen in the initial P wave intensity, not as much shaking? Ooh, that is a very fancy question. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, there is considerable variability in shaking, right? Um, the amount of shaking you feel depends on things like what is the magnitude of the earthquake and how far away you are from the earthquake. And as you were talking about doing trivia, like, are you, you know, on a hard mountain or are you on, you know, soft uh, sediment in a valley or mud next to a river or a bay or the coast? Also, you know, are you on the fourth floor of a building? Are you on the fifth floor of a building? Right, there's all of these things. But on top of it, right, there are also the dynamics of the earthquake itself, right? Even an earthquake of the same magnitude at the same distance from you can produce more or less shaking because as the question also put out, it's more questionable, right? Depending on sort of like how compressed the earthquake is, right? Like if you put the, the same amount of earthquake into a smaller area and it just pops off, that produces more shaking and, and higher frequency shaking than if like you spread sort of the same amount of earthquake overall, like if you, magnitude is, is length times width times slip. If you do that as more slip in a smaller area, that's, that's what the customer was suggesting, right? That, that pops off as a stronger earthquake. If you spread less slip over a larger area, that's a, that's a slower, smushier earthquake that doesn't shake as much and it tends to shake at physically longer wavelengths over the larger area. On top of that, it matters whether the earthquake is coming towards you or whether it's going away from you, right? Um, so it's it's like a it's like the Doppler effect of a train, right? If you hear a train whistle and it's coming towards you, it's mm, and then it goes past you and it goes mm, the actual sound goes down. <clears throat> Seismic waves are the same time. If you're standing, you know, on the San Andreas fault and an earthquake goes past you, it it shakes at higher frequencies that comes towards you, and then when it goes past, it goes to longer frequencies. Hmm. So the dynamics in terms of how much you, how much earthquake you cram into how small a container and whether it's coming at you or going away from you also affect the dynamics of how much shaking you feel. Gotcha. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> There's a really long one that has a lot of information in it. Okay. What is the main question? Oh, what was the information based on? So... Let's see. Okay, so on September 21st, this has a lot of data in it. It's referencing a lot of things. Okay, at the FEMA and USGS conference in Seattle, Freeman made three predictions. Number one, New York City would be hit by a major terrorist attack. One year later, that would happen. Number two, New Orleans would be inundated by a major hurricane. Five years later, Katrina hit. Uh, number three was San Francisco suffered major destruction from a huge earthquake. At the 2006 conference, FEMA updated this information that San Francisco will be hit by a major earthquake causing severe damage by the year 2031. What was this information based on and should we expect it? That's a long question. Uh, okay, so I don't, I was not at, I'm not sure what conference that was, I wasn't at it, but I'm going to guess those were scenarios that they were gaming out, not actual predictions. Um, I think it's just sort of amazing that two of the scenarios sort of more or less happened. Um, but um, table 
but more called tabletop exercises or planning exercises are, are very important. For example, it's very, um, there's a, that, that pretend San Andreas Fort earthquake I was showing is one that's used regularly for planning purposes, right? It's not a particular prediction that that particular earthquake is going to happen. That's just a scenario that gets used for practicing emergency response. Um, now, hazard, now, why I say we can't necessarily forecast a particular earthquake, right? They're like, this, this, this amount of fault is going to run at this particular day and second, right? We know the big picture, right? We know the tectonic plates and how much they're moving past each other and how, that's, and how that motion is partitioned across different faults, right? You know, that this fault takes up this fraction of that motion and this fault takes up that fraction of that motion and this fault takes up that fraction of that motion. And you mix that all together. And so you can say, ah, therefore, this, earth, this fault must have an earthquake you know, of this magnitude every so often, and that fault must have an earthquake of that magnitude every so often. And we can, we can calculate statistics like that and make sort of a forecast in the sense of we expect this range of magnitudes over this time horizon. But we can't, again, because we can't see the dominoes on the fault, we can't tell you when a particular one of those is going to happen. Right. Yes, <clears throat> that makes sense. Um, prediction is... Uh, a good thing to try and predict, but yes, we can never know. And that's in a few years. Um, so I don't see any other, oh, I see a question coming in. I was gonna say, if you in the audience have any more questions, put them in, otherwise um, we will uh, close down here soon. So, <clears throat> uh, well, this is kind of along those same veins is like, you know, what do you think about the big one, the earthquake that will apparently devastate the Oregon coast, uh, the percentage of that happening, and will there be warnings? Hopefully there will be warnings. <laughs> so this is what I think about big earthquakes. So one thing we've been talking about is how, for, how varied ground motion is, right? That the same earthquake depending on where you are located to it and whether it's going, it's spatially compact or spread out or um, you're in front of it or you're going away from it or what kind of material you're on, you can feel more or less shaking, right? And shaking is really what you care about. If you feel strong shaking, then you have survived strong shaking, right? If you lived through the very strong shaking from Loma Prieta, a really large magnitude earthquake is not going to necessarily produce stronger shaking, it's just going to produce more shaking over a greater area. Because remember, magnitude is the physical size of the earthquake. A magnitude eight earthquake is like a bunch of magnitude sevens happening contiguously in space simultaneously. But the shaking is not necessarily stronger. So if you have ever survived, if you've ever felt strong shaking, if you ever survived strong shaking, congratulations, you have already lived through the big run. Now, that doesn't that doesn't mean that you shouldn't also prepare for future big ones because right things happen. And if you do have a case where you have a bunch of contiguous big ones, a bunch of contiguous earthquakes happening simultaneously in one big earthquake, that's going to create regional effects, right? You know, it, it, it's going to have an impact over a much larger area. It's going to disrupt life more. So you're going to want to be prepared to, to deal with um, disruptions in utilities or, transportation. But that's true for so many things in life, right? We're, we're dealing with wildfire hazard. Depending on where you live, you may have flooding hazard. You may have um, coastal storm hazard. So there are so many reasons that you should be prepared for a disaster of any sort, whether or not it's an earthquake, whether or not it's a tsunami, whether or not it's anything in particular. Um, and you should take comfort in the fact that earthquakes are survivable, right? We can build things safely and strong and you can and you can survive and we can be resilient and you can survive earthquakes. They are not necessarily as scary as they sound sometimes. That's probably good advice. All right. Uh, we have some more questions. Um, this one's actually I think it's pretty interesting. How useful is it to have a, a distributed network of sensors like Shape, Shape Net operated by hobbyists? Um, that could be really cool. Um, I mean, there have been a number of, um, of 
sort of experiments with this. For example, there was a, a, a seismic network in California that was basically adopt a seismometer, right? You'd, you'd give them to people and they put them in their basements. Mm-hmm. Um, to some extent, you're trading sort of uh, robustness with, with, you're trading both sort of sensor quality, but also robustness, right? If we go out and we build a purpose-built seismic network, you know, we have our own communications and our own power supply, et cetera. Whereas, you know, I think a lot of us dealing with um, working from home these days are, are really experiencing all sorts of things that can happen with your home internet. And, you know, if your home seismometer is connected to your home internet, it just tends to go offline a lot more than any, you know, scientific one that's, you know, hardwired. Like a lot of them are on microwave signals or radio signals or, you know, dedicated cell modems or things. But, you know, on the other hand, there's a limit to how many of those you can build. You know, if you have, you know, people with tons and tons of them, you know, it's, it's, it's insects versus mammals. Do you only have a few of them and take care of your offspring? You only have a few offspring and care for them well, or do you just go for lots and lots of offspring and some of them will survive? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, that's interesting. Interesting, fun. Um, let's see. So somebody is commenting that you were saying that we can't predict earthquakes, but isn't the USGS forecasting earthquakes? kind of the same, uh, different terminology and they used it there in the question too. So by using the history, it tells us the location, the size of the event and the frequency. So yes, exactly. And you know, some of this phrasing is a little weird. So we specifically like to talk about it as like seismic hazard or probabilistic earthquake forecast, just to avoid the word prediction. Because when people hear prediction, they think like, this magnitude, this place, this time, set your watch by it. And that's, that's not where we're going. We're saying that over the long term, you know, because we know this tectonic plate is moving past this tectonic plate at this speed, we know we got to have an equal number of earthquakes to make up for that. So you, and so you can, you can make a, you know, get what we call a sort of a long term forecast that over the centuries ahead, we will have to have had this many earthquakes in order to to catch up to what the plates are doing. But I cannot tell you whether that's going to happen in a bunch of little earthquakes or a few big earthquakes, and if they're going to happen regularly spaced in time or in a cluster or today or 70 years from now, because that's that's not what the plate tectonics is telling us. It's just telling us what the total budget of slip that has to go into the faults is. Yeah. <clears throat> Don't you wish you had a crystal ball that could tell you these things? <laughs> I just wish I had a transporter to go down to the faults and you know, take careful measurements of them. <laughs> that would be helpful too. Um, uh, so in subduction zones, earthquakes can happen at great depth. Does the warning system take that into account? That's a great question. Uh, so that's actually the great depth is, is, can be very handy for earthquake early warning. Because remember, there are these two waves, right? There is the, the first wave, which is P wave, but it's lower amplitude. And then the, the stronger shaking is carried by the S wave. And so it's, it's kind of like lightning and thunder. They travel at different speeds. And the farther away you are, the bigger the time difference between when the two of them arrive. In fact, um, if you if you actually, just like with lightning and thunder, if you ever want to fall, know how far away you are from an earthquake, you can you can time when you feel one shaking and then the other shaking and then calculate how far away you are from the earthquake. Um, so if if an earthquake is, is really far under you, then it has to travel a long distance to get to the surface. So you have the, 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 the lightning to thunder time, the difference between when the first wave arrives and the stronger shaking happens in the S wave is already very long before it reaches the surface, which means you get that much extra warning time. So deep earthquakes are all friends. Well, that's good to know. Um, can you discuss soil lack liquef- liquefaction and its connection to earthquakes? Ah, so earthquakes can do a bunch of things. There is the direct shaking from it. We've but um, as we talked a little bit, there was um, tsunamis that can be generated from, from uh, undersea earthquakes. Um, if you are in saturated sediment, um, you can actually sort of play this game at home. Like if you take a cup and fill it with sand and then fill it with, with water, I mean, not underwater, but just like completely saturated with water, but just let it 
sit and then you shake it the 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 the, the um bottle uh the you shake loose the um the dot and the bottle and the and the dot settles a little and the bottle kind of comes out of it it's not it's not scary in a cup it's not even really scary necessarily for a human but your building doesn't like it when that happens underneath it um so that's a really it's an engineering hazard that can be very difficult to deal with so in the loma prieta earthquake the the reason that the cypress street viaduct collapsed is because it was on squishy sediment um you a lot of the damage in San Francisco was localized to areas that had um, squishy sediment to be completely fair. There were some other things that were going on as well. Like there were some magical, like we said, like, you know, sound waves do interesting things. There was a sort of a magical distance involved that right at that location in San Francisco as well that also helped, you know, focus some shaking. And so it was just a little bit stronger there as well. But in, in general, on like the soft bay, saturated, that's, that's the key word, saturated mud. But the interesting thing about liquefaction has is since it's about saturation, it's incredibly seasonal, right? If you're on the same material in a drought versus it just was the heaviest winter rain ever, one, one of those is going to liquefy and one of those won't. <laughs> So that weather, there may not be earthquake weather in terms of causing earthquakes, but there was definitely liquefaction weather. So we want things to happen in the summer then, in other words. Well, that's in this file, so yeah. yeah well, that's true. Um, let's see, you haven't mentioned Alaska. Does Alaska have access to an early warning system? Not yet. So California is the first to roll out because they really had that head start in terms of the seismic network because it was California and they already had a lot of seismometers installed. They didn't building out was required, but they they had a they didn't have to put out as many to have something that was worthwhile doing and the seismic hazard is significant as well. And so we're sort of just you know, potentially earthquake early warning could go, you know, over a huge geographic domain, but we're just sort of, you know, spreading out into what seems like the, the next most obvious place to go, which was, you know, continuing with the Cascadia hazard and looking at Oregon and Washington and building out those seismic networks. But absolutely, you could imagine wanting to expand to um, Alaska or uh, Nevada, um, you know, or potentially everywhere. It, it really just depends on whether you want to prioritize putting in the the networks and the the time and the energy and the money. And that's it's that's a decision that has to be made by people and the and their local governments. Yep, good point. Um, do you have um, any information or a knowledge of fracking and that resulting in earthquakes? Um, they're asking, you know, the water pumped in the ground for fracking resulting in earthquakes and where does the research stand on that? Um, so, um, induced seismicity is definitely a thing. Humans can cause earthquakes. Um, oil expo exploration can be a, a big factor in, uh, oil exploration or geothermal power can both be, um, activities that lead to induced seismicity. The interesting thing, so so fracking can cause earthquakes, but actually the thing in a in an exploration that even if it's a hydrofracking exploration that causes the most earthquakes um, is generally not the fracking itself, although that can cause some earthquakes, but disposing of the wastewater from extracting um, oil. Because it turns out that like oil is not the only thing you get out of the ground. You also get like a bunch of water and other stuff. And then typically they pump that back into the ground and that volume is a lot larger. And, and mm -hmm. also it goes, they typically put it under the, the formation that they're getting oil out of. So it goes deeper, you know, where the faults are. So most, so most induced seismicity tends to be connected to uh, the injection of the wastewater, but it can be um, connected to, um, hydrofracking. Geothermal also can have this, right? Because you're, again, you're putting water down to make steam to power your turbines, and that can do that um, as well. Uh, 
it really, it, as always, it depends on your dominoes and how your dominoes are lined up and whether you're doing something that, um, you know, makes a domino want to um, fall and whether there's another domino that's that can, you know, fall after that. Um, but, you know, typically these are sort of small potatoes compared to the huge stresses of plate of tectonic plates, you know, grinding past each other, right? That that's how you move, you know, a trillion cubic feet of fault, like in the 1906 earthquake. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, kind of another question back to the sensors. Is there a way that we can participate in setting up or, or enhancing that network? Um, that's great. Are there all... Um, a number of citizen uh, science experiments. Um, they are always looking for volunteers. Um, people, people sometimes host scientific uh, stations. That's what happened in California with the Netflix project. Sometimes they uh, get their own, you know, cheap little at-home sensor, like a dongle. That was like what the Crate Catcher Network did. Some buildings will allow you to. Uh, you know, will kindly let us put instruments in it so that we can understand how buildings respond to earthquakes, which is also important because we like all buildings. Um, and then there are some um, uh, there are some groups that are collecting data from from smartphones. Um, you know, because they're little like accelerometers and GPS chips in in your smartphones. There there are a lot of projects out there. I'm not going to go and recommend any of them because it's not like I understand their privacy policies or anything like. These are choices you have to make yourself, but there are absolutely things you can participate in if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if people don't know citizen science, I believe that citizenscience.org or .com is the website and you can participate in all different kinds of science research in your own backyard with your kids or on your computer. Or it's it's kind of cool. It's kind of fun. Um, okay. So let's see. In places like Japan with dense sensors, can they eventually map out the dominoes by the recordings of the magnitudes? Great question. So yes, more data is a huge help, but at the end of the day, right, your sensors are on the Earth's surface and your earthquakes are happening, you know, many miles under it. And so this is all an inference game, right? It's like having the lights turned off and listening to the dominoes fall one by one. Obviously, having more microphones, better microphones, really improves your ability to infer that. But at the end of the day, and, until somebody gets me that transport off so that I can get down into that fort myself, right? We are talking about listening from a distance and trying to figure out what we're hearing. Gotcha. So so this is kind of going back to, and maybe we've sort of answered this question, but I'll, it's, it's framed a little bit differently. So Cascadia has a history of relatively few to moderate sized earthquakes compared to the San Andreas Fault. Can this prior knowledge be factored into the risk for a large Cascadia event? Like, so by, you know, how, how risky is it? Do we know when there might be a large event coming? We hear a lot about the big ones coming, right? So, right. Um, so again, right, we can make these long-term forecasts because we know how quickly the Juan de Fuca plate, and quickly is not the word, we know what geologic scale of speed the Juan de Fuca plate is coming in under the North American plate. And so we know what that budget is and thus sort of how how much earthquake you need to have over so many years. And so we can, so that we know that the big earthquakes, you know, on the Cascadia earthquake happens, you know, less frequently than say the big earthquakes on the San Andreas fault because we can just do those, those budgeting problems, but also the big earthquakes on the Cascadia earthquake, on the Cascadia fault are even bigger because, and this is one of the trivia questions, when you are a subduction zone and you are putting one plate under another one, you have a larger area in contact. The width of the fault is larger and so the magnitude is larger than if you are at San Andreas fault and one, one plate is sliding past another one and you are cutting through the surface of the earth vertically. So earthquakes can only happen in the crunchy shell of the earth. They cannot happen in its chewy filling. 
And so if you cut through it vertically, the width of faults are very thin, and that caps sort of the maximum magnitude of, of a fault like the San Andreas, whereas in Cascadia, where you have um, one, one uh, plate coming under the other plate, right? You can, you can put a much larger width in contact that way, and that gets you to a larger maximum magnitude earthquake, which is why the biggest earthquakes in the world happen in subduction zones. And then how often they happen, we get from how, how quickly the plate is moving under the other one and thus how much um, slip you need to be accommodating through having earthquakes. Um, I feel like I've wandered off the conversation. Um, oh, uh, but there is, this is, okay, this is too technical, but there is an interesting debate about if you have some place that only has earthquakes very rarely, and, and so you don't really get to see them day in and day out, you'll only know from like historical evidence, like a drowned forest on the coast, that there was a ginormous earthquake someday, some point in the past, but there was just not a lot of earthquakes happening day in and day out. Does that mean, A, that the rate of earthquakes on that place is just incredibly low, right? You had the big earthquake and you're just waiting for the next baby earthquake to happen, but it just doesn't happen because the rate of earthquakes is just incredibly low. Or B, does it mean that this is a place that gets super duper stuck and it only goes once it's built up? It doesn't have very many earthquakes. It doesn't go until it's built up enough force that it gets that super stuck domino to go. I actually don't have an answer to that. And it's probably different in different places. That's one of those reasons that it would be really great to have a transporter and go down and take a look at that fault. Yeah, could you build one of those? It'd be really good. Can great. you build one of those? <laughs> I cannot. Uh, um, let's see. It looks like we just have a couple more. Um, this one's kind of an interesting uh, concept. It's asking about, can you use animals and insects to predict earthquakes? It says they're talking about like snakes in their den will leave their den before an earthquake. Um, they will leave and move faster. And there was something about cockroaches also acting erratically during earthquakes? Um, so that's one of those things where it, you, okay, so yes, often there was video of animals acting crazy before earthquakes, but to be fair, what you'd really need to do is ask not did my cat earth, act, act crazy before this earthquake, but count every time my cat acted crazy and figure out how many times an earthquake happened after that. And when it comes to my cat, I know the answer to that is almost never, in fact, I think actually never. So, I mean, animals act crazy a lot. Cats act crazy, dogs act crazy. I assume cockroaches act crazy. And so very often you will find one of those doing something crazy before an earthquake, but you often will find them all the time doing that and then no earthquake. Yeah. They're very unpredictable, so. Um, okay, so I think we'll go with this as our last question because you've been a trooper and we've gone through a lot of questions. Um, we also have another one kind of about the Oregon big one. And when the big one happens in Oregon or really off the coast, it's like, what can we expect? Would the ocean level drop initially as we saw off the coast of Myanmar? Would the coastline liquefy? Would tree land move underwater? Would tread land move underwater? Tree land? I, if that's a geographic name, I'm sorry, I don't recognize it. Um, so, so, so yes, and over the long term, right, there was, there was, what happens is the, the uh, ocean is coming in and it kind of pushes up on the land and then that earthquake happens and it slides down and that's how you end up with the f trees right on the coast ending up in the water and thus not surviving because big conifers don't really enjoy being in the ocean. Um, but I mean, that is right on the coast. I mean, you're, you're talking about feet maybe of, of displacement. And that's, that's not even that really, because it's, it, that's vertical. And actually this is, that's just a side effect of one plate coming under the other one. Like actually most of the, of the motion is, is horizontal. That, that's, that's a, just a tiny fraction of it that's distorting the, the, the shape of the land surface due to it you know, getting squished and then giving, giving way. Really, most of the motion is, is horizontal. And, um, and so there isn't, isn't a 
huge change in Sealand. It's not like, you know, oh, some places, some places that didn't have beachfront property is now going to have beachfront property, but it is enough to, to, you know, change the ecosystem of some trees, you know, right on the edge of what had been freshwater and is now saltwater. Um, and, and we've seen that in other places around the world. If you look at like Indonesia, when there's been earthquakes, right, again, it isn't like, you know, islands have appeared or disappeared so much as it is that like the, the trees right at the edge of the islands that were, you know, in freshwater before or now in murky water, or there were or things that like to be in swampland are now a little bit too high. But, you know, these are, these are really, you know, so sort of fine ecosystems right at the freshwater or saltwater interface. Um, but yes, there, there will be shaking from the earthquake. Shaking, if it's a really, really big magnitude earthquake, it could last for minutes. Um, but it depends, right? The magnitude 9 earthquake in Japan from 2011 was one of those ones that was a lot of slip in a tiny area. Because remember, it's, it's slip times area. So you can have a little slip over a large area or a lot of slip in a tiny area. Yeah. A lot of slip in a, in a tiny area was Tohoku. And since earthquakes run about the same time, it was over in two minutes, whereas the, the big one in Indonesia that, that caused a devastating Indian Ocean tsunami, that was more like a five-minute earthquake. They were both, you know, magnitude nine-ish earthquakes, but that was over a, a longer um, extent of subduction zone, and so that took a lot longer to happen. So if you're in a really magnitude nine earthquake, you're talking about minutes, but exactly how many minutes depends on whether it's a lot of slip in a little area or long or or slip spread over a longer area. Tsunamis, yes, you can generate a tsunami. Safe. The, so the idea is when you feel shaking, you, you drop cover and hold on. Once the shaking is over, if you are in a possible tsunami, tsunami inundation zone, you should evacuate vertically. You just wanna be above the water. So depending on where you are, that could mean moving inland, but it also could mean going up into um, a higher level of a building if it's, if it's a building that, that's safe for that or some places you know, have um, like specific uh, evacuation locations. I cannot tell you, please refer to your local evacuation guide and your local government to find out what the correct evacuation path is for a tsunami. But again, drop cover and hold on for the shaking. Once the shaking is done, if you are in a tsunami hazard zone, go to some place that's safe for a tsunami, which means up. But the details of that, find out from your local government. And then again, there can be liquefaction if you're someplace that's wet. Um, but that is that is with the shaking and it's done when the shaking stops. Um, let's see what else can happen. Uh, landslides can be caused by earthquakes. Um, there can be fire following earthquakes. There can be a lot of additional hazards, but um, the, the, the two big ones that you probably are thinking about are, are the shaking itself and the tsunami. Gotcha. Well, this has been really fascinating and um, I'm excited to learn a little bit more by going to the website and seeing what resources are out there. So, um, that was iris.edu slash shake alert. So I highly recommend that we all go check it out and get a little bit more info and figure out, I want to figure out how to get it on, on my phone or what apps or ways that I can get a little bit more involved. So thank you so much for the great lecture. Big applause. Thank and you for having me. Thank you everyone for coming. And then I just have a couple closing remarks. Um, I hope that everyone enjoyed tonight's event. Um, if you would like to watch the video again, share it with your friends, check out the video section on Anzi's Facebook page or our YouTube channel. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for updates on future events and inspiring content from Anzi. And I know I mentioned it at the beginning, but please consider supporting Science Pub at making a donation via the Facebook donate button, or you can visit omsi.edu slash donate. Uh, join us next Tuesday on October 6th for a lecture by Randy Jant, an ecologist from the Alaska Fire Science Consortium, who will tell us about the increases in unusual wildfire events in the forest and tundra in the Arctic regions, including Alaska, Canada, Russia, Greenland, and Scandinavia. Once again, thanks to our partner Celestream for helping make tonight's event possible. And as always, you can get more information on our website at onzi.edu. Thanks and have a good night. Thank you.